30 years, and I have over the years had the pleasure of having Dr. Tom Bendetti on many, many, many times, and he's here once again. Welcome, Tom. Aloha. And uh, I'm glad that Tom also invited a very special man. I didn't realize when I, Tom's got so many different aspects to himself. I didn't realize when I first met him, or even up till like a year ago, that you were part of the Hawaii Disability Rights Center and that you're on the board there. Yes, I am. I'm very fortunate to be on the board. Yeah, and we've got Lou Urchek, uh, fr- who's the executive director, calling in from Oahu. How are you today? Oh, uh, fine. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. I appreciate that. No, I'm, ha- I'm happy to be on the call. And, uh, yeah, Tom has uh, been on our board for a long time, and he's a very, very valuable member of the board. Well, you know, I have been learning so much about Tom, and through Tom I learned a lot. But um, I didn't realize uh, much about the Hawaii Disability Rights Center and I guess that one of my first impressions as I was doing a little bit of background research is how large an organization you are in Oahu. Well, I mean, you mean in terms of how many people we have working for? Yeah, and, and, and how many what, and how many things you cover there as well. In terms of, like, things that we do yeah. and stuff like that? Yes. Yeah, well, we're actually part of a nationwide system. Mm-hmm. Uh, there, there's an agency like the Hawaii Disability Rights Center in every state. Uh, we're part of a national system called Protection and Advocacy, and we are funded by the federal government, and we operate under federal law. And in every state, there's, a, there's an organization that gets designated. So we have been designated as that agency in Hawaii, and uh, we have about 20 people working for us here, but we do serve the entire state. And uh, I'd, I'd be happy to share as this call develops, if you like, some, you know, some of the different kinds of things that we do and so forth. Yeah, I've been, I've been learning about that, and I realized that Tom, of course, for years here was at the head of the Mental Health Kakua, and uh, the Hawaii Disability Rights Center and Mental Health Kakua Oahu are presenting the Hawaii premiere screening of One Little Finger at the Doris Duke Theater coming up, gosh, that's just in a week and a day, o- October 2nd at 7 p.m., and uh, we're very, very thrilled that um, you're taking part in this, and Tom's involved in this as well. Yes, I'm quite honored to be involved in it, and it's a wonderful film with the theme of trying to rid stigma attached to having a disability. So, again, uh, I'm very thrilled to be a part of it. Yeah, I, I, I think you'll be very interested in this one as well, because you know what? This really addresses um, quite an interesting issue, and Tom and I were just talking about this, Lou, is yeah. the fact, well, that, what a huge situation this is, especially in India. We were just mentioning, because a lot of this is filmed in India, mm-hmm. and, and I don't know if you're aware of it, but this film actually has 80 people in it that were hired that um, are not actors, but are uh, young people and adults with disability. And, and they're, yes, you know, exactly. <laughs> I mean, these are, these are real people with real disabilities. These are not actors playing people with disabilities. And so uh, the filmmaker is trying to show just what people can, with disabilities really can do, that there's, a, that there's a lot of myths and stereotypes and prejudices er, that exist, whether it's in this country or around the world, uh, where people think that, you know, if you have a disability, you can't do much. And uh, the idea of the film is to show uh, just how much people with disabilities can do. Absolutely, and and again, there's a lot of stereotypes in India. Tom and I were just talking about the problem of some of the people in India thinking it's bad karma that that brought them the the. the yeah, the I didn't. Ta- yeah, Tom and I had a had a similar conversation last week when he was in for our board meeting. Uh, I was not aware of that either. Uh, so it 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 is sort of interesting. I mean that you know we see everything from our own perspective sometimes and. You know whether it's you know looking at from the state of Hawaii or from the United from the United States, uh, people with disabilities have a lot of issues here, obviously. But when you compare that to uh, something like like what's going on over there in India, where if, if if they're thinking you have a disability because you did something really bad in your past life, and now that therefore you were brought back as this person with a disability. That's a whole other thing to try to overcome, right? <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, I've been in music uh, most of my life, Lou, and uh, 
And I love, and I've worked with Rupam for years, you know. And Rupam, oh, you have? Oh, yes. He's he's an amazing man, uh, amazing man. Of course, he was born in India, but has lived in the Bay Area for years. And I can't tell you how much he's worked to help so many people, including me. Um, but he's very, very dedicated. He worked for years doing this film. But oh, w- w- an important. Okay. I, I didn't realize that you knew him. Oh yeah, we're good friends. And and the thing that's interesting is that he uses music in this film to Mm -hmm. show how music can help draw people together and heal them. And I've always believed that. We've seen this, and I know that um, we found that when people are working in music, um, they're able to be joined together as a healing force, and that's really the message behind um, this film as well. And, of course, Tom's Uh done so much in the mental health field, and I didn't realize he was part of what you're doing over there on Oahu as well, uh, working to break down the stigma of mental health and to try to get funds, which is so important, right? Well, right. I mean, uh, I mean, we do a lot of different things. I mean, it, I mean, yes, trying to rid stigma is something that we do. Trying to secure funding for different things as well. I mean, a lot of what we do is is also, I mean, fighting for the legal rights of people with disabilities. Uh, we represent a lot of people uh, to try to make sure that they can live in. Uh, in an integrated fashion in the community. Back in the older days, people used to live in like large institutional types of facilities. And, and so the whole trend of the disability movement now is to have people actually living out in the community, fully integrated, doing the same kinds of things that you or I or anybody else would do on any, on any given day. What do you see as some of the biggest challenges? I mean, of course, every island's different, every state is different. Hawaii has its unique situations, and I know Tom realizes that, and I realize that as well. But, I mean, there, there's some, you know, here we are way far away from where all of the uh, decision making is going on in Washington, but you've got to be very involved in a lot of the legislative process and also enforcing what could be some very old codes and old buildings that were never kind of updated, right? So there must be a lot of issues you're dealing with all the time. Well, that's true. I mean, I mean, we operate under the state law and the federal law, and so I periodically go to meetings. I go to at least one meeting in Washington, D.C. in the spring, and then I've got a meeting coming up in Denver in a few weeks where I meet with my counterparts from around the country and with our national organization to kind of keep on top of of, you know, what, what's happening and things like that. But the laws, the actual laws that, that protect people with disabilities are pretty good, I mean, I mean for the most part. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, I mean, you know, things like the ADA and stuff like that. And so, uh, in effect, I mean, in terms of, like, architectural barriers, uh, I'm, I'm less familiar with the neighbor islands, but I know in Honolulu that actually they've done a pretty decent job of, uh, you know, making things paved with curb cuts and and you can jump on the bus and 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 you in a wheelchair and you can you can actually get around pretty good mm-hmm. uh so a lot of progress has been made i think uh you know and one of the areas that tom and i do a lot of work in is the idea of is of mental health and that has been a little more problematic i think uh i think there's a lot of stigma attached in particular to people that have mental health issues. I mean, if somebody, if somebody has a physical issue, if somebody is, is, is paralyzed or, that, or they're blind, I mean, most people tend to kind of feel bad for them and, and, be, and you know, and, and they're considerate of what their needs are. But when it comes to mental health, people somehow seem to not see it so much as an illness, as, as much as they sometimes think that, well, there's something wrong with you. And so that's a, that's a real problem. Absolutely. And Tom knows this, right? I mean, oh, he sees yeah. this challenge all the time. Right. And especially with the homeless population now and, uh, and getting affordable housing and getting the, you know, the different programs that we lost a few years ago back in place, that's been a major emphasis for me being on the board. It has, Tom, and, and Tom has really been a, a, a true spokesperson for, for doing that. He's written a lot of papers about, uh, and he, you know, he was involved, right? I mean, you were, when you were the, ser- I think the service area administrator on Maui working for the Department of Health, I mean, back, back at, during a time when we actually had a reasonably robust community-based system of mental health care, uh, 
and a lot of that has been somewhat dismantled o over the last 10 or 15 years. And I think that's what's created a lot of the problems. You didn't have as many people that were homeless 10 or 15 years ago, but, but with the lack of services, this is, this is what you're seeing when you see these people on the streets. Uh, absolutely, and, and it's got to be really hard, too, for people who are having these challenges. to. It's hard for anyone to find housing, let alone... No, if, the, uh, <laughs> exactly. I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean the, 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 you know, housing in, in Hawaii is a problem in general. I mean, it's expensive. Salaries are not that fabulous. So even for, like, you know, so-called regular people, it's, it's still a challenge. But, but, but for a lot of these other folks... Even just getting and going and applying and all that, the whole thing is overwhelming to a mm -hmm. lot of people. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and, and then the advocacy of them realizing they have the rights and, and being able to stand up, because I think a lot of people must be afraid. I don't know. You tell me, Tom, are some of the people you run into afraid to try to stand up for themselves or you know, go to the point of a lawsuit if they are discriminated against, or how does that work? Well, basically, that's the issue. This population, does, they do not have a voice. Mm -hmm. And and that's what uh, Lou and his colleagues do, and and what we advocate for on the board. So, uh, but the other ironic thing is, if these community services were in place, it would cost much less than what's going on right now. Really? Because these people are becoming institutionalized, either being put in jail, uh -huh. or in, you know, uh, or the state hospital, which yeah. which is costing us an enormous amount of money as taxpayers. Well, that's, oh, that, yeah, that's and, and, as well as, I mean, uh, a, the tremendous overuse of, of the emergency room right. care, right? I mean, so that's, I mean, this is, it, it is an irony, as Tom says, and, and it's, I express this a lot of times when I go to the legislature and talk to people that even if you, I mean, certainly we come, we come from a perspective of being compassionate towards people with disabilities, obviously, but even if somebody wasn't that compassionate, you know, even if they've addressed a total number cruncher, uh, and uh, the, the reality is that it's cheaper to provide basic care up front than it is to sort of deal with it on the back end. Uh, so a lot of these people uh, end up going to the emergency room and, and, and they, they flip in and out. They, they, they decompensate, so, so they get picked up, they get taken mm -hmm. to the emergency room, they get stabilized, mm -hmm. and then they get put back out on the street. And this thing kind of cycles back and forth. Emergency room care is expensive. Yeah, it's it's usually uncompensated. So somebody's eating that cost and paying for it. So uh, it's very expensive that way. Uh, and they're clogging up the jails. Uh, mm. That they're, they're getting picked up for, you know, re really minor things like you know loitering or, you know, I mean, I mean, th you know, s stuff like that. And they end up they end up going to the prison. I mean, uh, the, about at least a third of the people up at OCCC have mental health issues, and uh, jails are. Jail, I mean, it, it's a common saying in the disability world that that jails are basically the new mental institution. Mm, my gosh! And of course, there's the issue also of employment, which is if if you can get for people who have the ability to work. The help, and we do have some good organizations here. I'm sure you've seen them, Tom. Here, I don't know how it is in Oahu, but the employment really is a key part, right, for people who are challenged to get a job. Well, right, and it's important that uh, I mean, whether it's a, whether it's a, a physical disability or a mental disability, I mean, uh, employment is one of the air, is one of the sort of the new frontiers, I think, in terms of trying to fully integrate people with disabilities. Uh, in many ways, Hawaii has done a pretty good job of, inter um, of integrating their housing. I mean, less so, less so with the mental health community. Although, though, even there, there's still a lot of group group homes uh, that, that that people live in. I mean, not everybody with a mental health issue was homeless by any means. A mm -hmm. lot of them are living in group homes. People with developmental disabilities are living in community care homes. Uh, so they, but. But the area of unemployment, un unemployment is still much higher among people with disabilities than it, than it is with the rest of the population. And mm -hmm. so uh, it's a matter of educating employers to the idea that these people can do 
they can do the job, they can get things done. They're you know, and uh, and maybe even providing some, you know, f- tax benefits or financial incentives if that's what it's going to take. But that still is a challenge in terms of getting trying trying to reach more full more full competitive employment for people with disabilities. Well, I was so impressed when Tom suggested um, bringing this film with Ru Palm to Oahu and. Um, and for me, it's taught me quite a bit because I was really not aware of everything that the OI Disability Rights Center does. I was mm-hmm. somewhat um, aware of mental health kakua. Um, but to see you embrace it with your team, and I think Rupam's calling in on their line, so I can introduce you. Aloha, is this Rupam? Aloha, Cindy. This Hi. is Rupam. Hi, Rupam. I'm <laughs> going to introduce you on the phone here to the d- executive director. Of Hi. The, Hi, how are you? I'm looking forward to seeing you next week. Same here. I'm excited to see you too. Yeah, and and um, boy, they're doing a lot of work with this, and it's a. I, I I was talking to Tom how beautiful this Doris Duke Theater is, and how special it is that it can be there as well, right? Oh, it's a very nice place. Yeah, it's it's connected to the Honolulu Academy of Arts, uh, which is a beautiful museum. Uh, it's a very nice uh, setting for this. Have you ever yeah, been in a, in a um on a in Hawaii before, Rupam? Yes, I've been to Honolulu, but never been to Maui. So I'm oh. looking forward to do it as well. Oh, well, good, good. Well, we're looking forward to having you here as well. Um, so it's going to be a very special night. Tom Bendetti's here with us as well. Yeah, aloha, Hello. Rupam. Aloha. <laughs> Tom, Tom's looking forward to meeting you as well. We're going to be talking to Rupam in a second, but I want to thank Lou. Um, it's so great talking to you, and I know um, you're also not only the executive director, but a lawyer, and, and you're doing so, you're making a big difference in what you're doing, Lou, and... Mm. and I just have to say thank you for the hard work you're doing. No, that's my pleasure. Yeah. Pleasure. yeah. Thank you. Thank you, and we appreciate you calling in today. Have a great oh, so afternoon. You want me to? I mean, I was. I mean, I'm. I'm happy to stay on oh, the call. Or oh, listen. okay, sure, sure. Then we can. We can. You can listen to what Rupam has. Sure, to Sure, I'd like to. Yeah. Oh, great, great. <laughs> well, let me do a yeah, brief. Sure. A brief inter. Well, let me do a brief introduction of Rupam. Number one, I've known Rupam for, gosh, about eight or nine years through the music field and. Um, he's a man who I call a master, and you're very humble, so I know you don't like that, Rupam, but I call you a master because you are, um, number one, um, uh, so dedicated to the work you do in so many ways. I, I would ask Rupam to maybe put a piece of music together under a song or words I've done, and he'll get a whole symphony and write a piece <laughs> and do the whole thing with this huge symphony and bring back this amazing piece of music for free and, and donate it. Um, he's not only a musician, he's a filmmaker and a computer scientist and entrepreneur and um, Guinness Book uh, World Record holder and um, also Billboard number one artist in world music and uh, Telly Awards gold winner for One Little Finger and uh, you've directed feature films and documentaries and you were born in India and I was trying to um, connect with Tom Vendetti, um, the area, because he's got a film he wants to show you when you come over. I think the area you were born in was close to where Tom actually did um, shot a film up there of the Tibetan Illusion Destroyer. Where were you born in India, and where's that, Rupam? Yeah, so thank you for that introduction. <laughs> uh, thank you for all your kindness over the years, uh, Cindy. Um, coming back to your other question, um, Tom, yes, I have um, seen some of your video videos from that region in Tibet, very impressive work with the Dalai Lama and all. Uh, I was born in Assam, which is actually northeastern part of India. It's a state in the northeastern India. Um, this is actually situated in the eastern Himalayas. Um, but the connections between the Tibet and, and Assam is uh, the river that flows through the state and also uh, it starts from the Himalayas in Tibet. Uh, I believe it's called a different name, which is Sangpo River. Yes, um, yes. Right? Yes. Yeah, that's Sangpo correct. River that flows um, through Tibet and goes through um, Assam. And in Assam, it's called Luit, Brahmaputra River. Right. So that's where the connection is. Oh, the music I see. And yeah. The culture, yeah, the music and the culture is, is all connected. You know, it's so much rich culture and the heritage there. Well, of course, I knew your background and in music, and um, I love the fact that you've embraced music as a way to help with healing, 
And of course, um, you when you do something, you don't do it in a small way, Rupam. You do it <laughs> you do it in a very big way. So this what inspired you to take on this huge subject of um, one little finger and and three or four years of your life working um, to bring this this video, uh, this actually this film, it's a full length feature film to to reality. Uh, yes, uh, big way or small way. I think it all starts with very small initially, um, and which is just a small dream, um, and that becomes a bigger dream. You know, when other people accept that um, as part of their dream, and and then it does not. It's not my dream anymore. It's everyone's dream. So that's when it becomes big. Um, so um, my inspiration came from over the years when I was working with the healing music and working on different research projects, working with people with disabilities. I met so many people and the parents and the children in different parts of the world. And I was intrigued to know more about them and I have seen it firsthand. I was inspired by their life stories yeah? and wanted to take the challenge of working with them and ended up working with over you know, 80 children and young adults with various disabilities. So what we tried to do is you know, using music and the media as a platform, um, we allowed differently able people and these children to perform in this project alongside you know, other award-winning artists um, to promote inclusion and diversity. So just to prove the point of ability and disability. So that was the theme of our movie, Ability and Disability. And you certainly were able to get huge casts. Of course, you know, if we were to do this in America, this would be a million-dollar-plus project, as it still was. It's, I'm sure, a lot of work. But you had a lot of people involved in this, this movie. Did you ever figure out how many people are in the movie? I, mean, I was watching the trailers and parts of it, and it's like, wow, you've got a lot of folks in this movie. Yeah, just the children itself, uh, more than 80 plus, you know, um, well over that. And if you count the other actors and the entire crew, that's a huge custom crew. Um, and I like to do things realistically. It's a realistic movie, realistic story. It based on real life stories, um, and there was almost no artificial artificial set, film set. So it was all real time, real situation, real people. So that was our goal to keep this film as realistic as possible. Wow, which um, brings up all kinds of issues, of course, doing sound and lights and things such as that. Because Tom, Tom, of course, has done many, many <laughs> films, and he knows what it's like because he mostly does all documentaries. But right. the issues with the elements mm -hmm. come into play when you're not in the studio, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm sure that Tom has <laughs> more experience working on the location sound and all. So, so we had some of those challenges as well. And the biggest challenge was to work with these ch children. Mm -hmm. um, who have different disabilities. Uh, some of them could not hear, could not see. Uh, they have uh, different challenges, um, mental situation, cerebral palsy. Um, and we have some older adults as well, so they had uh, dementia, uh, could not memorize the lines. Uh, but we took those as a challenge just mm -hmm. to complete this and give them a chance. This is a platform for them. We want to prove the point that everyone has talents and, and they have to overcome those barriers and, and think and come out of the box no? that they were in. So that mm -hmm. was our challenge as well. Um, it, was, it was a lot of fun and we grew up with them and we learned a lot and it gives us a different perspective of life. Mm -hmm. What they what they go through. Well, I'm sure um, that's true. And maybe you could give us a brief um, story. Uh, I think they call it the elevator uh, pitch, but a little bit of the, the idea of what the movie is about. Um, yeah, the movie storyline is, since this is a feature film, based on real life stories, I can give you two lines of the story. Um, it's about uh, Raina, uh, who is playing the role of American neurologist. She uproots her life to research music therapy in India 
and finds herself um, teaching different children and adults with disabilities. And by bringing them together through music, she inspired them to challenge themselves through their abilities. Um, and after that, their lives are transformed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it must have actually, you must have seen uh, children actually and young people who made new friendships and who actually in real time when this is being made are learning. Uh, and, and, and you probably saw a lot of individual stories where their self-esteem and their their own um, self-worth is probably um, affected by being in this movie. Yes, yes, it did. Um, initially, it was a challenge. Uh, so we had to find their own talents and, and lift them up. So we wanted to let them know that they're capable of doing anything, just like anyone else. So that was the early, early years of this project. Um, now they're completely capable. They have the experience of acting in this film. Some of them have gone on their own to do acting in theaters and, and films. And they have started writing their own books, wow. of their own stories. <laughs> wow. Um, and I have published um, one of their books. So one of them has um, reached out to me. He said, okay, write their own stories. I published that book. And after that, he, he wrote the second book and the third book. On his own. <laughs> I didn't even know that, Rupam. You never even let me. I had no idea. That must have been. I mean, how did you feel seeing that? That's changing someone's life. That's amazing. Yeah, and and uh, so seeing them, um, and an, another person who actually got involved with one of our earlier projects. So Cindy, you were on that too. Uh, Action moves people united. Yeah. Um, and and there was a, a girl named Ziza. She wrote a poem called Disfigured. So we um, created that music track and had her, had her poem and also her voice in it as well. So Jija is also playing a role in this film too. So you'll see her um, playing one of the roles and she's playing the same name, Ziza, um, in this film. And she has cerebral palsy, um, but she's amazingly talented. Um, so disability does not mean that their brain is not working. What was, what, was capi capable, no? what was it like for them to see the film? I mean, you must have shown it to them. I, I really would have loved to see your face and how you felt when you saw them watch the film. Uh, not all the children have uh, seen this film yet, um, but when we did a private screening in, in India, in Kolkata and other places, and some of those children who were from that region, so they came and watched this film, and it, it lighted them up. You know, it, it proved them that they are capable of doing anything else. They had seen themselves in the big screen. They felt like they're the star. Mm. And that's exactly what we wanted to do, um, show them that pursue your dream. You know, do not let your disabilities limit your abilities. You know, um, it was amazing to see them. It it must have been, and, and I know Tom knows this because he's worked so hard with these films. But um, there's always this passion and hard work of making a film. But sometimes the hardest part's going out there, and and doing the festivals that you've been doing and doing the promotion. <laughs> and there's a lot of work involved, and especially if you're an independent filmmaker like you are, to try to to handle all of this. But you hit the road with this film. And um, you've been getting amazing response. Um, we're talking all around the world, right? Yes, yeah, we're definitely blessed with the recognitions that we're getting. And we are definitely thankful for that. For that. But we are definitely not looking for awards or anything of that sort. But we want to send a message out and raise the awareness about the human rights. Um, and. As you know, that this is not just a film, that's not the end of the road, it's a movement. Mm -hmm. It's a movement mm -hmm. to break the barriers of the stigma of disability. You know? uh, so that's what we want to educate everyone, at least um, mainly the younger generation. Um, and hopefully they will be inspired by this, and it will change their mindset. And, and so that's our goal. You know, definitely not the awards, uh, 
it helps, it, it motivates us, and these children are the real heroes. And they're excited when they hear about this news, about their work. But we have a lot more to do. No? And we have been continuing to work on the disability sector and education and other areas and other research areas as well um, beyond this film. So I'm, I'm hoping that there will be other breakthrough coming down in this near future. Well, you have a background that you've done, which is very interesting. Of course, you did engineering, and but you went on uh, to continue not only engineering, but sound engineering and music, of course, and you got a BS in engineering in India, and then you got the doctorate from the George Washington University School of Engineering and Applied Science, and your dissertation was um, artificial intelligence and machine learning. And I know you told me a story about going to Cannes, and you, I mean, just to be able to go to Cannes and, and see the film showed in Cannes must have been an amazing experience, but you were able there to make some interesting connections for that other part of your life where you're actually trying to work with artificial intelligence to help um, in this field as well. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about that. Uh, sure. Um, yes, my background was uh, computer science. Originally, that's what I studied. And, and for my uh, doctorate, I did artificial intelligence, but the, the research was artificial intelligence and autism um, because I needed to you know, select um, a, a specific areas of interest for my thesis. Um, so that's why I focused on the artificial intelligence and autism. Um, and the primary focus was to find, um, understand the behavioral patterns of these children uh, who are autistic. And, and trying to find early intervention methods. You know? uh, so that was m my goal. And uh, just in the United States alone, as you know, that uh, one out of 59 children probably autistic um, or under autistic, uh, autistic spectrum disorder. Um, so that's a huge number. And the number is, number jumped from actually um, from 400 10 years back to 59, um, one out of 59 children. Mm. So to say huge issue uh, from medical standpoint as well, there are a lot of research currently going on, um, but my goal was to find early intervention methods, see how we can find out early on what patterns of behaviors do we see with these children and is there any way we can improve their communication skills or social skills or behavioral skills early on, not to wait until eight years old or 10 years old um, so that we can provide them the care and, and different educational methods for specifically for them. So that was my goal in my thesis. So what was it like going to Cannes? With, here you are, and you'd never been to Cannes, France before, had you? No, I've never been there. This is the first time. What was that experience like? And tell me uh, how you showed it and what the, was the response there in France. Yeah, it was a great experience. And a lot of people were there. We met a lot of people, um, similar mindset, a um, lot of filmmakers, um, commercial filmmakers, and, and they also had other areas of interest. Um, there are many other sessions there where I was able to speak about uh, the research and the film. So I always try to connect the dots with the film and the other things that's happening, um, whether it's research or music therapy or how music can affect human mind, body, and soul. So I try to connect all of those dots together, um, and that seems to get a lot of attention and interest. So that's how I met some of the scientists there who are not actually filmmakers. Um, so they invited me to um, other sessions to join. Uh, that, that's what we were talking about. I think we had a conversation about that, Cindy, earlier. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. A couple of months back. So yeah. tell me, where else is this? Sh the, I know you've had showings in a lot of places, and off the top of my mind, I'm thinking I remember there was one that was going to be in Italy, I think, in Spain. There was one in... I don't know if in London was going to happen, and then there's Florida, and there's, I mean, it's, you've been running all around the world with this film. Yes, we have visited um, many places. We could not be in all, all the places at the same time, 
um, but we have received the recognition in most of the places that we went. And, and we have been to Florida, uh, recently Cincinnati, San Diego, and we had the Santa Monica premiere. Um, Italy, Italy I could not go, um, but we got some awards there as well. Um, London coming up pretty soon um, in the next uh, few months. And we had another one in Glasgow, in Scotland. Oh. So it's a variety of places like that. Well, that's a lot of work. And you know I'm always here for you. If you ever need me to go <laughs> to any of those places like London and you know, Spain, or, you know, I'd be glad to help, you know. Um, but, <laughs> but no, and it's kind of nice. I didn't make it to Santa Monica, but I, I knew you were coming here to Maui. And also to Oahu. So, I mean, I knew I'd see it here. But um, there were some great pictures because Quincy Jones, I know Kevin Mackey's a dear friend of mine. In fact, he kind of got me in, in the beginning to work in some of these spoken words projects in the Grammys. And kind of, I think I met you through him. But um, but I, I know you know him very well as, as, as well. But Quincy Jones um, is on the soundtrack that Kevin worked with with you. It's a double CD soundtrack that is just exquisite. Um, you've got Quincy Jones, Julian Lennon, Kathy Sledge, Janice Ian, um, and Laura Sullivan, who I love, a voter Kellerman, um, Ricky Kej, who's amazing, um, and of course, yeah, the album. and of course, Dave Mason. Wow. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah, Dave Mason, yes. Um, and, and, I, Cindy, I think that was the earlier album. Uh, yes, I worked with all of them. Oh, at different times. All, Got all, it. Okay. Yeah, at different times, different uh -huh. projects. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's on your. Uh, you yeah. got in Wikipedia as well. And you're gonna have to show <laughs> me how to do that. I, I was impressed you were in Wikipedia. Um, but on the CD, my gosh, you have um, again Julian Lennon, Dave Mason, and and so many people um, that do a beautiful Chris Rutherford, of course, with Kevin Mackey, and and it's yeah. and Jan, is it John Jan Close or Jan Close? It's Jan Jan, Jan yeah, Close. Jan Close. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we're gonna play a, a piece or two off this in a while, but. I mean, just doing this scene. And we had Saida, right? Saida Garrett and, and Kitchi. Wasn't Kitchi Saida Okuchi. the one that worked, that wrote Man in the Mirror for Michael Jackson? Yes. Yeah. She wrote Man in the Mirror and also she performed with Michael Jackson. Wow. That's it, it, and, and Quincy Jones, who was rather elderly, actually came out for the Santa Monica showing. Yes. Yes, he was an amazing person. I so down to earth. You know, we all enjoyed spending time with him. You know, it's really, <laughs> really interesting because uh, Rock Hendricks is going to be performing here on Maui, and he also played with Michael Jackson. It's true. So yeah. Great. there's a connection. Oh, you'll, lo you'll love Rock Hendricks and George Kamoko. I'm so glad you're going to be able to meet them as well because yeah. they're both very unique, wonderful people. And, of course, Rock was blind right. um, for a lot of his life. And he, he, when he heard about this project, he said, you know, we got to we got to do this. I got to do this. I got to be involved because that's one of his passions is trying to help um, people. Especially in his case, he knows a couple of blind musicians here. He tries to help as well um, because he did have an operation. He's able to see now, but he's not sure how long that's going to last. So he could go back to being blind at, at any time. Right. Again. So you're going to love him, though. He's an amazing. He's gotten like, oh, I mean, I, I think over 10 Billboard top number ones because he records with uh, Paul Hardcastle. And, um, oh. They, oh, he's he's amazing. He's quite, he, He'll be great. And he'll be playing a piece with George Kamoko. You'll love George. George has awesome. gotten like four or five <laughs> Grammys, and he's got a, he's he's always on the road. You're going to, it's a whole different world out here, though. I have to say, Rupam, you're going to see, you're <laughs> going to see a whole other world over here. And Maui's very different than Oahu, of course. You know, Oahu's, You'll see the, uh, the the big city there, you know, in, in Honolulu. But um, Maui's a little, um, Tom lives out in the country. Right. Uh, with a stream down below him and uh, a lovely home there, you know. So so it's 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 a whole different experience here. And, and um, you know, we're very excited. I, I, I promised I'd give away a pair of tickets um, to the Maui show because you were very kind, Tom. You actually gave tickets to us to give away. And you also gave tickets to um, Imua. Right, right. To bring some of the people in from Amua Rehab. Right, so we're looking forward to that. And again, they deal with people primarily with disabilities. So their whole you know, uh, agency is dedicated to that purpose. Yeah, I mean, that's, that was, I was just, it's, Tom's been so behind this and so helpful. But 
Um, if someone wants to win a pair of tickets to the show that's happening on Maui on October 5th at 7 o'clock at the McCoy Theater with uh, Rock Hendrix, George Kamoko, and Rupam will be there. And uh, the movie is going to be amazing. And if you'd like a pair of tickets, you can call now. 244-9533 is the number. And Gary, our wonderful Gary over there is waiting. 244-9533. That's 244-9533. Um, because we really do think that this is going to be, I mean, you've seen this, you've seen this, Rupam, you've seen people cry, you've seen people just coming out of theaters. What are some of the, the, the comments you've been getting when people come out of the movie? Yes, I think Kevin told me many times about that, and I have seen myself um, in, when I visited East Coast and other places. Um, many people are touched by it, and so during the Q&A session, uh, that was very interesting in all the places, and the audience starts sharing their own stories that they have never shared before. Um, it's, sometimes it's very heartbreaking to hear their own story, and somehow they find a connection with this film that that um, someone who could not speak. It's like like uh, horror. Um, and the challenges that someone in the film they go through actually happen to someone sitting in the audience. Wow. So that's where you find the connections. And if you think about it, disability is statistically probable um, that it, it could be, anyone could be disabled at any point in their life, uh, not just by born disabled. It could be you know, by old age, or as we can't in our life. Um, so we, we all need to treat everyone with love and respect. That's what we want to share, share that message. And, and people love to hear that. You know, they feel that we're making this film to just to represent them and telling their story. They find the connections with their own life. Which was, again, you know, you had that motivation, which is a very pure intent. But like you, I think you implied it that these take these projects take on a life of their own, and and it is amazing how this has happened. I mean, number one, who would have guessed that you would have connected with Tom and been able to show it on Oahu and have it shown here, and and make this connection? I wouldn't have dreamt of it. I have to say, Tom has been amazing in, in supporting this project. Um, but um, besides that, I mean, think of how you've touched all the people um, that were in the film. And then the people, like you just mentioned, who had some of these same issues in their life and they're seeing a film about it, right? I mean, it, it's really, truly um, what we all hope to do, which is life-changing, <laughs> right? We all hope to make a difference, right? Well, the thing is, is that when you take on projects like this, they do take on a life of their own. And the other thing is, is that being a filmmaker or a storyteller or whatever, it's so gratifying to be able to... Uh, you know, put your energy in that direction. We get as much out of it as I think the people, you know, that we're working with. Mm. And um, so when you're sitting in the audience and again, uh, people are having emotional reactions to it, it again, it brings, to me anyway, integrity and, and all of these feelings that I've really done something, you know, to make the world a little better than it was before. And I think Rupan is certainly on that path. So. Well, I don't. And, and you are doing amazing work as well. He is. Um, most of your work is similar to yeah. you know, what Thank I have you. been doing. So. Yeah, um, and and you know, Tom retired a year ago. You know that. <laughs> well, that, that's, well, that was from the forty-hour work week grind, right? But, <laughs> but, <laughs> but now I do things on my terms, and again, it gets back to uh, the things that you know that I really want to put my energy into, and and. An example of this is is help promoting your film, you know. So, and and you know, you, you. he's also had quite a few of his films. I guess over eight or nine films on PBS. Uh, Twelve now. Twelve okay. films on PBS, and when you get your film at that point, when it's ready, to, you have to talk to Tom about getting <laughs> on PBS. Right. Because yes, I'm looking forward to speaking with him and and know all of his work. <laughs> 
because uh, you've seen the difference, right? Well. Once it gets on PBS, it reaches people you never would have imagined it, it's going to reach, right? It takes on a life of its own. Well, again, it's, uh, PBS is in just about every house in America, so, and Canada and, and other areas, too. So it's, it's a really a good way to get you know, the message out. Uh, abso yeah. ab absolutely, it's so true. And, 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 and like you say, this is, this is still in its early stage. You just completed the soundtrack August 30th, I think, and, and the film is still um, you know, in its early stages. But like you said, it's going to be in London. And, and then where else are you looking at after you get through with uh, Hawaii? Where are you going after that? Um, we're going to India after that, India, then East Coast. Then Sacramento, and the Northern California premiere. Oh, um, nice! So. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's yeah, al so that's almost your backyard. I'm in Sacramento, but India. Where are you going to yeah. go in, in, in India? Because I know you have deep connections and you've worked with the Indian government, and um, and that's got to be fulfilling when you get to go back to India and have them uh, recognize you. Plus, you've worked and you've been, you know, you're a very humble man, Rupam. Um, but you've worked with the UN and the peace projects, and you. You've gone to the UN many times and worked there. I think you're an ambassador for peace for the UN, aren't aren't you? Yeah, ambassador for uh, UNESCO Center for Peace. Yeah. Mhm. Mm yeah. So and and you did that, um, and you are in the Guinness Book of World Records. How many people did you get on a stage at one time? <laughs> 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 yeah, number of people were uh, over five hundred, but the over five hundred. Uh, uh, but the, but the Guinness World Record was not for that. It was most number of unique instruments used oh. um, you know, to compose a piece of music. Mm -hmm. So we had people came from all over the world to perform together uh, that I composed a piece of music with different types of instruments, unique instruments. I mean, all are different instruments. How many, uh, so how many had, did you have? So we had, uh, we had um, 315 unique instruments. Wow. That's got to have been a challenge to Mike. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Absolutely. That was a huge challenge. We have over 300 plus mics. <laughs> really? Oh, yeah. my. Oh, my gosh. And plus, yeah, many different types of um, gears and how to create the sound that we need. So that wow. was an amazing experience. Wow. Uh, wow. I know you also represented India in the Festival of India concerts in France last year. And yes. um, that must yeah, have that been was, wonderful. Yeah, that was great. It was great performing in Paris and other places. Mm -hmm. uh, I was representing India, and a number of musicians came from from India as well. So we all performed together. Well, I'm going to uh, play uh, a, a piece from your CD. I got it, and it's beautiful. Um, and we're going to do Voices of the People. Um, which, you know, is from various artists, the music that you wrote, and uh, has Julian Lennon and May Pang and Dave Mason. So those are the, they're doing a piece. And your poem is there, too. Yes, I know. People can go to, what's the best site for people to see trailers and information about One Little Finger? Uh, they can go to onelittlefinger.com. All the links are there. They can click on the trailer link. They can go to the album link. Um, all the videos are there. Well, There's a preview video, song video that we just released um, yesterday. So um, when you get a chance, watch that one. That has a snippet of different audio clips from all the songs. And there's a video that goes with that and also has some behind-the-scenes clip. Yeah, I, su I suggest Tom maybe play that when we uh, before we get in the inter intermission maybe here. It um, might be nice to show because a lot of work went into that. and. I know you're very busy. I've been after you to do an interview for over a year, Rupam. So I feel Thank very. You. My <laughs> <to come> here. <laughs> He's like you're too busy all the time, and you're so humble. But um, I I just adore you, and I think you do amazing work, and I can't wait till you get out here. So thank you so much for taking the time to call in, Rupam. Thank you for having me. Okay, it was wonderful to speak to you, and and I I cannot wait to come to Hawaii and and Maui. We'll see you very soon, right? Yes. Aloha. In a week. Aloha. Aloha. Have a wonderful day. Thank bye you. Bye-bye. Bye.
Believe, and then maybe you'll see the dancer that's inside of me. My brain says yes, arms and legs may jerk. I'm just trapped in a body that may not always work. If for a moment we could stop and see each person for who they really can be, we'd not limit people due to their body's disabilities. We'd find a way to treat them equally. You have to take off your mask and show the world what you could do by showing off your amazing talents. It seems that more often the greater obstacle is in the misconceptions that surround the disability than the disability itself. People with autism have a voice. Even if they cannot speak, it is our job to bring out that voice to be heard by the world. It could be a picture drawn by them, a sound played on an instrument, or a piece of jewelry they make. The word love, let each of us strive to share this wonderful word and the energy that it can provide. Sometimes thought of as a cliche, love is the answer. And in today's world, now more than ever, the expression and actions of love to our fellow human beings is the thread that binds us all together. Humanity is about using our hearts along with our minds. We are all part of this tapestry we call life. The world that I envision pray and hope for our future generations is one of love. It is a world where hate and prejudice no longer exist. It is a world where we see ourselves and others and the internal and external dividing borders no longer exist. A united world of hope and dreams. We're leaving out our own game changers, the people most skilled at surviving, adapting, adjusting, overcoming. We are leaving out society's greatest problem solvers. Treating everyone with compassion and love, affording them the same rights and respect that we want for ourselves is tantamount to our own success as thinking, feeling, and loving human beings. Love is the positive force that powers the world. It runs through each human being. And once you realize you have the power to choose it, you can create an amazing life. Love conquers all. We need to set aside our differences and help each other achieve greatness in our own special ways. Nothing is impossible with unconditional love. You can be the change. Together, we are the change. Just because a person is disabled doesn't mean they shouldn't have basic human rights. They should have just as much access to do whatever they choose to do, just like everyone else. Like individual drops of water merging in the vast ocean, you and I bring a unique gift. We are whole. We are perfectly imperfect, lit from within by the same universal spark. Let us shine with purpose, knowing love is all that is. Opening our hearts to family members and strangers with disabilities is learning to love them and accept that they do things differently than us. Love is the strongest force for change in the world. You will always be right when you respond with love. We are all human. Let's accept one another. Disability means unique opportunity through inclusion and belief. Disability means new possibilities through acceptance and positivity. With open minds and open hearts, disability means achieve. Recognizing human rights and people with disabilities is the first step in making sure each individual reaches their full potential. Whatever a person's ability, their talents, gifts, all of them have something to offer. And it's a human right to be able to fulfill their ambitions, make their ideas a reality, and be included in the community. Human rights are the basic rights and freedoms that belong to every person in the world, from birth until death. These basic rights are based on shared values, 
like dignity, fairness, equality, respect, and independence. That everyone is an individual and should be treated as one, even though they may be a little bit different. Many people overcoming obstacles told they would never walk, walking around, told they would never be a cheerleader, being an award-winning cheerleader, told they would have to stay in a group home, now in an apartment with a roommate and working as an advocate for other people with special needs, the ability in disability. But equality is not enough for us. We need love. We need respect. We need caring for everything that lives. Heroes in this world come in all shapes and sizes. Never underestimate the power of fierce determination fueled by a glorious imagination, but achieved through quiet dignity and courage. It's about us, about us all. People, animals, trees, water, air, the whole nature. We need to protect life. Love life on our blue planet. Disability means unique opportunity through inclusion and belief. Disability means new possibilities through acceptance and positivity. With open minds and open hearts, disability means achieve. Special needs children must endure things every day that most of us take for granted. They shouldn't have to face their challenges alone. We all have something special to contribute to this world. All lives have meaning and value. Together, we can create positive changes that allow people with disabilities to be treated with dignity and respect. Human history has been longing for the potential of world peace to become fully realized, and then you were born. Imagine how essential the tenacity of your compassion will support human rights today as a gift of hope for us all. The face may be different, but the laugh the cry, the love, the feeling of pride in their gains remains the same as mine. We were all created equal, and as human beings, it is our responsibility to fulfill our Creator's mandate. Quality, freedom, dignity, respect, words. Words can be so very powerful that they can create positive social change. When we dare to break the silence, and speak of incomprehensible actions, only then can we begin to heal and build a better world for all people. I was always told that we don't live our lives wearing someone else's shoes, meaning we don't know the kind of life someone else is living. I always give everyone I meet a big smile, hold the door open for them, and try to lend a hand wherever necessary. Some folks are right at their breaking points and an act of kindness may just bring them back from falling over the edge and reaffirm their faith in mankind. And when we're around people that deal with disabilities, such as having problems walking or talking, it would be great if we could be helpful instead of judgmental to them. And I think that should go for everyone, including our leaders. People are similar to flowers and that different flowers need different things to flourish to reach their peak bloom period. People with disabilities may require different equitable solutions to be successful. We should embrace differences in people the way we embrace different flowers. They are all beautiful. There is ability in disability. Look at the person, not the wheelchair. See us for our abilities, not disabilities. Even though our minds are young, treat us like adults, not children. Let's see our disabilities as different abilities. We are beautiful, loving, and unique people. It's time to stop these judgments when they appear to see past our own inner fear and understand the power of our heart and soul that can inspire our lives with the strength it shows. Let the world see the power of love that lives in you and me to overcome all challenges we face and we will make this world a better place. Disability is only what you perceive. Ability is everything of what you believe.